Well, hello, this is Pink Lou. This is Home Security Edition, episode 160, Defending Your Digital Footprint. Now, this is what I set out to do on Pink Lou, and along the route of seeing my favorite YouTube uh, creators get purged and the truth being hidden, I've had to sidetrack a bit to, to focus on turning the light on and and continuing the information that I have. So I have another episode coming out today that's gonna dig deeper into the surveillance and the shadow banning that we've been experiencing. But I do wanna at least get back on path here for this one episode and um, give you some tools, uh, maybe not at this point enough to take um, significant action, but to at least provide some food for thought as I move forward in this series. So this is Pink Glue, it is November, the six defending your digital footprint home security edition episode 160 on this we are going to talk about home wi-fi we're going to talk about social engineering and of course we're going to talk about amazon's new drone that will chase you around the house while in the middle of the night um not the most brilliant thing we've seen so far. But here we go, let's start here. This is, I just put in digital footprint so we could even start with what that is. And I've got here your YouTube, I'm sorry, your digital footprint, what is it and how can you manage it? So Rasmussen said, your digital footprint is data that's created through your activities and communication online. This can include more passive activities, such as a website that collects your IP addresses, as well as more active digital activities, such as sharing images on social media, or even your friend sharing images on a platform like play, um, Facebook that tags, it does um, facial recognition and will associate names with it. And even if you've never been on the platform, it will start um, t associating your face in different images and building a, a core group of friends or peers or acquaintances that you have. Um, a, as an example of how serious that this can be in the real world, um, one of my cousins who has, you know, now has two babies and hasn't been on Facebook in, in many years other than to occasionally um, look at it where I'm not even with an account, and that's a whole nother story, but she'll occasionally look, but she doesn't post anything, she doesn't like anything, she doesn't interact with it at all. And uh, one of her, her friends contacted her and showed her a message that Facebook had identified that my cousin was leaning in one direction politically, and thus they specifically suggested that this friend unfriend my cousin. This is really serious, the level of depth that is, is um, coming up in the real world. Now, what if you're looking for a job? We all know that employers will look at social media profiles. Well, what if when they pull the social score that Biden is, is um, proposing that's very similar to what's being used in, in China right now, and all of a sudden your print, your information comes up and it not only goes beyond what color hair you have, what color eyes you have, what your intelligence level is, what kind of pictures you post, but it actually gives your political leaning which may or may not fit within that hiring manager's political uh, leaning, and it'll give a recommendation that they should not hire you. All of a sudden, you're out of a job. This is really, really significant what's going on. So let me go ahead and keep moving on through this. So here we have uh, Rasmussen. I clicked on the link that I, I read the header for. This is rasmussen.edu, a student experience, college life, what's a digital footprint. This looks like some kind of a, a student uh, created page from what I could read from the author. The um, author is Christina Erickson. This was created in 2018, May of 2018. Now I might point out, it was May of 2018 when Google decided that their cultural creed of don't be evil was going to be erased forever. This is a very significant turning point in history. Not that it hadn't happened before this point, but they finally took away the creed altogether and have moved full force uh, beyond that. So your digital footprint, what is it and how can you manage it? Every email, post, photo, click you make online leaves a trail. Even by reading this article, you're adding to your ever-growing string of breadcrumbs online. It's permanent. It follows you for life, and it's not going anywhere. It is your digital footprint. You may wonder, what is a digital footprint, and why should I care about it? 
Whether or not your information is shared intentionally, it's being gathered by advertisers, employers, companies from which you shop. This information is called your digital footprint, and it's becoming more important than ever in today's digital economy. While there's no official definition of the term digital economy, it can be summed up as the entire ecosystem built, ecosystem built from our online connectivity. In this newfound era, the digital footprint can no longer be ignored. Uh, many individuals will say, hey, I'm not doing anything wrong, or I'm not, it, it, it is beyond about you doing right or wrong. It's what's being done with your identity that is beyond a gray area. People know what's right and wrong, and companies are paid a fortune in order to gather data. This is how uh, Gmail works, right? Do you pay for your Gmail account? Some companies do now, and some um, start paying for, for storage, but predominantly Gmail is a free platform. It's not free. They are selling your data out the back door at massive amounts, not only for the advertising that they're, they're gathering, but also actually selling your data, your digital footprint, time and time again, not only via APIs, open connections that they allow developers to tie into and scrape any amount of data that they want, but they actually package it and sell it off to the various government intelligence agencies around the planet. Then they also sell it to companies who wanna use this information, let's say, to direct your eyeballs to a certain um, election, a can elect, um, election candidate, as we saw in 2016, and again, 2020 very heavily. It might, um, it's definitely being sent to insurance companies, so your insurance rates are gonna um, are, are going to change based on the peers you have and whether or not there's images of you drinking um, or smoking or whatever classification um, gets sent forward at that time. A uh, medical insurance will be is affected by this. Um, and of course, job opportunities are highly guided um, by this information as well. So I'm going to continue here to help you understand what that means for you, we spoke with a handful of online experts to learn more about digital footprints, learn from their expertise and see what you need to know about managing your online presence. So what is a digital footprint? First, the answer to your question, what is a digital footprint? Your digital footprint is anything that is about you or put out about you online, says media and personal branding consultant, Brian Harrington. That includes social media, your own website, articles about you or written by you, it spans all time and doesn't include uh, just and doesn't just include what's found on the top of the page. It can be information that is both easily and hard to find, he explains. Take note that your digital footprint isn't just things you actively put online like photos or Facebook status updates. It's your information that is being scraped. Here's that term again, scraped. So let me define it further here. So this is being scraped for more passive online activities as well. So scraped means, um, I'll give a, a simple example here. Let's say that you have a LinkedIn profile. You have an ability to go into the backend tools and request that LinkedIn send you all your information. And, I, and Facebook, you know, all of this data is now, you can request it, but stick with LinkedIn. So what they're gonna send you is any job you've applied for, any post you've written, Anytime you visited somebody's page, anytime somebody's visited your page, any uh, interaction you've had, any like, any um, it, all, data, it, it can be booklets of data. You would absolutely be surprised when you contact the various entities and asked for what is in your, your digital pr footprint. But essentially scraping the data means that um, you are somehow creating a request, whether you are encoding specifically or you're making a request to the company, as in uh, links, LinkedIn's, and it goes in and it grabs all the data in one swell swoop and sends it to you either in some kind of a, a Word or PDF or an Excel spreadsheet. So most uh, data comes into some kind of a, a file in a spreadsheet so that the, it can be, uh, the, the data can be managed. So an example of this is, let's say you have over 5,000 contacts in LinkedIn. That data then gets scraped, all that information gets pulled into a spreadsheet, and now you can walk away with all the contacts that you have within LinkedIn. 
Now, limitations are being more and more put on this, but they're being put on it for your access, not for the API access, meaning a company or an individual programmer um, would would request access via backend tool to have an opportunity to have their software interface with a particular software. So in this case, if I'm a developer and I'm creating a tool that's going to add on to LinkedIn to let's say help people manage their calendar as an interface with LinkedIn, then of course I apply for a rights to get into an eight in API partnership. Some of them, there's no application. Some of them, you just go right to a, a page and you have open access. And in doing so, because I'm a developer and I'm kind hearted and I'm doing this truly to help society, I now have open access to as many portals, contacts, information as that company allows before I get to firewalls. And you would be amazed the depth of this. Now I've spoken before on, on how critical this is. Being in Silicon Valley, I was a keynote speaker not, not that long ago, right there in um, heart of Silicon Valley. And, um, and there were uh, all the companies there you would know. They're big name companies. And I, I just did a quick survey in the room of these IT developers. And let me point out again, an IT developer, an IT specialist is not a digital security expert. So I would ask an IT developer or a software engineer, how many of them in their engineering a, a blueprint or roadmap that they created in the development of the software that they were gonna launch into society came up with any sort of digital security protocol, a zero. And then I would ask, um, I'm sorry, there was one on that one. And then I would ask, and in that plan of the digital security, did you allow any consideration for the protection of the user or was it solely a protection of your company? And then of course, that individual had not allowed any um, protections for the user. They can't because when you have a, a startup that you're bootstrapping, or even a, a, a later stage company that you need to get out to the people, you are worried about two things. One, how fast you can make revenue and how, how fast month over month that can grow. But the reality is we see companies for, for years, decades, that never bring in any money. So how are they alive and still being funded? Eyeballs. The more eyeballs they can attract to their site and gain traction by grabbing that data, gets them more and more funding and keeps them in the game. So by putting any sort of restriction in there or digital barrier or cybersecurity um, user rights, they're slowing down their process. They're making it more difficult for the user to want to engage and that friction, although in the benefit of the user, it, um, will cause an individual to shift their eyeball somewhere else. So companies just don't do it. So don't ever assume that you're signing up for a, a company that's well known and global and altruistic and has your, your best interest in mind. 100%, they do not. And even these terms and conditions that are requiring that you, the user of a platform or a service or you know, whatever, anytime you go somewhere online, they have to tell you this website uses cookies to ensure you have a best experience. No, it doesn't have anything to do with your best experience. And in fact, we'll find out that there's other terms that they're using as well beyond cookies. And Firefox is, is bold at discovering, at relaying that with transparency, but most sites still will not even acknowledge it. So let's look at the terms and conditions. When terms and conditions came out, they were in plain language, uh, regular type. Anybody could look at it, get a basic understanding of what they were agreeing to, what they were um, giving up. But it was very user friendly because they wanted more and more people on the platform. So they wanted to make it transparent. And in fact, many sites didn't even have user agreements. And as soon as they needed to, they still worked in the best interest of the individual. However, by the time now you have a new TNC update or terms and conditions update, it's too too late. Because let's say last week you went in and you reviewed all your, your privacy settings on Facebook as example. So you can go into the security settings and toggle everything over. There's little um, bars usually that you can just slide or click on back and forth and say at what level you want your information shared or um, communication received or messaging to go through and, and there's all these toggles. But when they update the TNCs, 
you might notice that all those toggles default back. They are reset in the favor of the platform, not in your favor. And until you catch it and you go back and correct it, it is not in your best interest. All the information, and let's say that they do that one day and, and you're quick to notice the next day, which is usually not the case because knowing that they have TNCs coming out, they'll normally delay that a bit of time. So it, it might be a week or 10 days before you're even notified that they're changing because they have this window of opportunity before they have to disclose. But let's say that you catch it on the first day. It doesn't matter. If it's been even one minute, in that one minute, they can have open scraping of all the data that you had declined or messages that you had had blocked. They can sweep those through as they change their uh, terms and conditions, and you can go back in and reset, but it only took a moment in between. There is no grandfathering of the TNCs is what I'm stating. So let's, um, let's continue here. Uh, take note that your digital footprint isn't just things you actively put online like photos or Facebook status updates. It's your information that's being scraped from more passive online activities as well. Your digital footprint is data that's created through your activities and communication online. This can include more passive activities such as a website that collects your IP address. That's correct. Every time you go to a website set, site, it's collecting your IP address. Do you think that's in your best interest? No, it's not. But that's a piece of the puzzle that reaches out to who you are. And a lot of information, including hacking, can occur right through an IP address. It's like giving the address to your front door. As well as more active digital activities, such as sharing images on social media, says Natalie, at, um, owner of Ormi Media. You should keep in mind that anything you place online, whether text or images, has the potential to be available online forever. And forever is a long time, which means it's all the more important to keep it on top, to stay on top of your own digital footprint. Now, if we think for just a minute a comparison of this data gathering that is literally forever now, um, even information that's deleted can still be um, a tracked down and grabbed through um, way back time uh, software. Uh, but, but even if you file bankruptcy, that rolls off your credit in six or seven years, depending on the terms and the, the classification. So even if you uh, borrow a massive amount of money from somebody and you choose to never pay it back, you can sit there, file bankruptcy, and then sit on it for seven years and you get a fresh start. With your digital information, there is no fresh start. So let's continue. How is your digital footprint used? Your digital footprint is often used to obtain personal information about you, such as demographics, religion, political affiliations, or interests. Information could be gathered using cookies, which are small files, websites store on your computer after, you vis after your first visit to track user activities. Yes, that is correct. The company puts information on your computer. This is why it's really important to constantly clean out and erase your cookies. Cookies are also, are, uh, also allow you to hold items in a shopping cart, store preferences, or log in information and make personalized suggestions based on your location and interest. So again, let's say that you log into a, a walmart.com website and you go back in two, two weeks and your stuff is still in your cart, thanks to cookies. They're doing it so that you don't forget that you really needed those uh, items and that you can go ahead and, and buy. But is that in your best interest? Okay, your digital footprint is used by advertisers to target you with customized ads. For example, if you look at a pair of shoes online, you may later see ads for those shoes or similar items. Now, give an example of this. Uh, this week I was looking at, uh, somebody asked me about a um, particular kind of industry of cluster of careers that they were interested in. So I looked up a few and then there was one that I thought would really be appropriate. So I went ahead and clicked on it and saw what their application process would be. And then I sent over the, the link to the individual with an overview so that, so that they could take a chance on this. Well, um, I believe that was only two days ago. It might've been three now. But yesterday, I already got a phone call from Intuit. Their tax um, area wants to interview me to come on board for a job with them because I had clicked. I never even saw an in, in, 
uh, TurboTax or Intuit or any of those advertisements or portals while I was researching any of this. And yet they had grabbed my data from just me clicking on information about another, um, another company altogether. And, and this is uh, very transparent and very quick response, but this is what we get. Your digital footprint is also used by employers, both current and prospective. It is especially important to care for your digital footprint if you're job hunting, as Googling is now a central part of the hiring process. An online background check by recruiters, employers is a common practice these days, says the founder of Signature Post. In worst case scenarios, individuals could lose their job offer if employers come across something inappropriate. Now, now we've seen that that is not even the worst case scenario. With cancel culture, this is, was again in 2018, this is now 2020, cancel culture will say that you rolled out of bed, you grabbed a t-shirt out of your pile, you went out and uh, went fishing with your, your children, somebody snapped a picture because you happened to catch a big fish that got on social media and all of a sudden you're fired from your job because that free t-shirt that you got somewhere that was in the bottom of a pile that you threw on to go fishing, somebody didn't like and you're canceled. And yes, that just happened three months ago. Uh, it, uh, really, um, it was all over the news as well. Uh, fortunately, there are plenty of ways for you to be proactive in managing your digital footprint. Take a look at some of the following tips. How can you manage your digital footprint? So how can you manage that digital footprint? Here are a few places to start. One, Google yourself. Take inventory of what's out there. Search for your name every few months so you you're cognizant of the information that others have to access. And this is very cursory. What you have access to on Google will surprise you, but it's not nearly the depth of what uh, an investigator, a legal term, or even an HR office has. Set up Google Alerts. Hanif recommends setting up a Google Alert for your name. The tool will then send you occasional alerts of every post that that has your name in it. Now, I don't know if Google Alerts still has the same setup. I use Google Alerts. I set it up probably four or so years ago, and I get massive international information that comes in. As soon as it's posted somewhere, it comes right into my email in, in nice little packets. But of course, you can set it up for yourself or any research projects that you're interested. Protect your personal data. Don't disclose your personal address, phone number, passwords, or bank card numbers. Consider using a nickname instead of your real name. This is huge. Have you ever gone to a doctor's office and there's, they ask you to fill out two pages of information? First of all, just because there's a blank space and you have a pin does not mean you have to fill it out. Wake up. You still have your own privacy. They're going to ask as many questions as possible. You're waiting in your, their waiting room so they know that they, they have a captive audience. And most people will just think, oh, this is important. How many times do you then turn in the paperwork and go talk to the doctor and they haven't even read the information? No, it is not in your best interest. It has nothing to do in your best interest. It's an opportunity for you to give the hospital administrators information about you as they collect data. It has nothing to do with your, your service in the, um, with, with your own doctor. Now, one step further than this, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, okay, so let's step before we go to that, Epic. Epic is a company based out of Wisconsin, and what they do is they maintain medical records. So they make it very easy for your medical records to be found as you move from doctor to doctor or hospital to hospital or insurance plan to insurance plan, and they're locked in. Under um, personal protection, uh, personal private um, identity information, they're locked in that they cannot share that without your permission. Well, just in January, I switched from one healthcare system into in a completely different healthcare system with different insurance and everything. And uh, sure enough, I walked in to see the doctor and they had my Epic profile up. And I said, how do you have access to that? Under current laws, you do not have the right. And the person said that, well, I'm a doctor and, and I, can, I can just tell somebody that you came and see me and it's okay. I said, I'm telling you it's not okay. But by then they'd already not only seen it, but they printed a copy of it. This information is far and wide. And if that's a doctor's office that has access, that means everybody has access. So this is epic. Now the, the next step, as I mentioned, if you're sitting in a waiting room and they've given you a few pages to fill out, don't fill in all the blanks. 
they're getting more and more uh, intrusive. The last time I went in to see a doctor, they wanted to know how many guns I had in my household. What does that have to do with my annual visit? Absolutely nothing is the answer. You don't fill it in, you don't respond. However, now I've talked about EPIC and the, the openness of your medical information, which by the way, as a side note, you are a human being. Unless you are having a severe situation where you are on an immense amount of medications and you're worried about the interaction, you do not need your medical records to follow you. That is not something we need in life. You can go into a doctor with an issue. Now, it would be great if we were at the point that rather than waiting for all the dashboard lights to go off for somebody to step in and come up with health path and, and guide you along that, that would be awesome, but that's not happening. Current Western medicine today helps you after the dash lights are on, after your car is broken down by the side of the road, then they step in. They don't even care about your health history. Now, the next step I wanted to get into on this path of filling in blanks is now in Silicon Valley and, and probably most United States, when you go in to see a doctor, it's not on paper anymore. They'll hand you an Apple iPad and it will ask same questions and it will include how many guns do you have in your household it won't ask do you have weapons or access it'll ask how many guns they're very very direct they cut through it and they'll ask um have you used illicit drugs in the last one year two year day very very bold questions that um no they are not private they can turn those over to the the police and you are volunteering the information because there was a line there. But as soon as you put it into Apple, you do understand not only does that go into the Epic database because Epic, um, the backbone that Apple is using through these, the, the data gathering in the waiting rooms of hospitals and doctor's offices is connected and tied in directly to Epic. But Apple as a company is also scraping that data. And you think, no, they're not. They're a high security company. Well, a year ago, they had their, their big release, and it was all about that Apple Watch that they were releasing. And it was kind of like watching an old Visa commercial, I'm sorry, an old American Express commercial, where you leave home and, and all these things happen, and your luggage is stolen, and you're in a whole nother country, and you have no help, but don't worry, honey, I have an American Express. I'll make it all better. Well, this is what that the promo that Apple tried to pull with the heart springs a year ago when they released their updated Apple Watch with all kinds of monitoring. And the heart strings they pulled was that every good child will buy this for their parents because what happens if your parents happen to fall in their house and they can't get up and they need assistance? Well, if they have this Apple Watch on, you're a good child. They'll be able to contact you. You will be notified that it has been at rest or at an odd angle for a period of time and you're at the rescue. Do you really think they care about your parents? Let's just be more aware. If there's a line, don't just fill it out. If Apple's giving you information, maybe you don't wanna fill out the information. So the last time again, I went into a doctor and I was handed one of these Apple iPads. I said, I'm sorry. As a, an Apple employee, I cannot fill out this form because I do know that it goes into a data profile. May I please have a paper copy? And you know, they had a whole drawer of paper copies they were more than willing to hand me. And again, with the paper copies, I went ahead and selected what information I felt would pertain to the situation and offered information accordingly and left it at that. A lot of it was blank. And in fact, when I turned it in, I was told, oh, you forgot this page. And I would say, no, thank you. I'll discuss that with the doctor. So there's a lot of ways for you to protect your personal data and not volunteer criminal activity. Okay, here we go. Another keep login information under lock and key. Never share any of your usernames or passwords with anyone. This also, we've been told many, many times again, don't use the same password on every site. That's a, the first thing hackers will do. There is no need to use online password savers. You know these ones that pop up. Many of them are actually embedded right in the browser now. Doesn't that make you question? Why is this important? Not only do you need to be responsible for your own usernames and passwords and figure out a way to manage that, but let's say you're using one of these drop, there's I think one pass and there's, there's a series of them. Well, 
Facebook as an example. If I open up a Facebook tab, which now you don't even have to be a Facebook user, but let's just make it easy. I open up a Facebook tab and I'm looking at Facebook. Face, and then I've got other tabs open, but not logged in. So let's say the tab next to my Facebook tab, it could be any one of these, is a bank. Let's say it's Bank of America. Then what they can do is they can just walk on over here and you don't even know it's happening. The tab will never even look up. If we go to this one, it won't even look up and they can access the passwords that you have logged in, logged into your Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Citibank or whatever account it is and see how much money you have in there. Well, if they can see it, they can also grab it. And I dealt with a major identity theft earlier this year of them gaining access via Bank of America account and scraping out um, $2,500. And what they did is they set up a series of emails in order to pass the money through. And then from that point, they, um, they had that money converted directly into Disney gift cards. Now, do you know why Disney gift cards? Well, Disney gift cards, they, they offer an online number, so it, it doesn't have to be mailed to an address like many of these. It's just a, a digital number. And there's no tracking. Once you convert into a, disc, a, a gift card, you don't get the money back. And so it was a very quick and easy way for them to clean out this person's account. So don't use any of these passwords that open and unlock tab access as, um, as common as this is for one login to go ahead and, and open up all the others. The next one, think before you post. Never put a temporary emotion or a, on the permanent internet. Anger is temporary. Online lasts forever. Pause before you post. Think twice, post once. Advises Sue Chef, online defamation survivor and author of Shame Nation. And again, this is 2018. 2020 is far beyond Shame Nation. This cancel culture destroys everything. Nix the pics. Any photo you post could be dug up someday. Limit your sharing of questionable images. 15 minutes of humor is never worth a lifetime of potential humiliation at Chef. Now, this is huge. How many of you have seen the advertisements to, to find your let's say senior picture, and maybe you graduated 20, 30 years ago um, before we had the internet, before we had uploading of images, before we had all these digital concerns, and yet those are all online. But more so than that, you obviously did not give permission for your image to have been uploaded onto the internet if it was 30, 35 years ago, because we didn't have the internet. But what you did do is when you went to school that day, by allowing somebody else to take your picture, they own that image. And they, in turn, have sold those over the years in many different directions. So let's fast forward to today. What happens when your child gets their school picture taken? It is posted online at the school. It is used in, in, in thumbnails and screenshots. And, and um, the not nice people who PEDO um, for kids are are using these in order to track down targets and identify and pick and choose. Now, this is way out there, but of course, a couple months ago, uh, literally two months ago, there was a, a big issue about Wayfair and the Wayfair high prices, which when you look up what Wayfair actually means and what they were selling, it was um, not exactly for the item being listed there, but specifically into the description um, which was uh, human trafficking. Uh, benefits of digital footprint. When done wrong, your digital footprint can be detrimental, but it's not all doom and gloom. When they're done right, a digital footprint can provide you with a great first impression. You're now aware that employers are following your trail, so, that, so take advantage of it. There are many ways you can leverage your digital skills to land a job. A strong online presence, A strong online presence um, is, or a digital footprint can be a career asset in today's competitive job market. Many employers are performing online searches in addition to reviewing resumes and cover letters in attempt to learn about prospective hires, including their interests, industry involvement, and more important, their ability to market themselves effectively, says Diane Domer. Uh, Domeyer, sorry. 
um, career expert and executive director for the creative group. Now, anytime there's a link on here, feel free to go through and click on and find out a little bit more. Now, what does this mean? Let's say that you are working for one of these fabulous tech companies. Let's give um, Google as an example. And Google tells you uh, directly that you will never be promoted because you're a female or you're over 30, or in, in this case, the protected age would be 40. And they're very bold because that's the culture. So there isn't anything wrong in their mind with what they're saying. So they'll tell you. And if you question it, they'll even send you an email confirming that. And, and yet, um, once um, HR is informed that you have raised a question, your badge will be terminated. So, so here you are without a job. Uh, you haven't done anything wrong other than uh, do a great job showing up at work every day. And when you um, ask, you know, what can you do to to get yourself ready for any next round of promotions. This is the result you got. And all of a sudden, a series of, of steps took place to get rid of you because you're a troublemaker. You haven't taken any action. But at this point, you either walk away and get another job. But if you're in the tech industry, age and uh, gender is, is very big. You will probably find it at the next door and the next door and the next door. And at some point, you just got to stop and say, wait a minute, it's not me, it's you. As much as we want to be accountable in our lives, the process has to be stopped. So let's say that you go down and you file maybe a Department of Fair and Housing or an Equal Opportunity claim for them to at least help you to figure out what happened. And you're altruistic, so you don't want money. You just want an opportunity to apply for the next job. And yet, what comes out of this is now anytime any employer searches, they're going to see that you had a DFEH or an EEOC claim, and you are going to be less likely to be hired because you are a troublemaker. Again, you were the employee that showed up every day helping out, and you just wanted to figure out what would be the next path. Others had a view that's absolutely illegal as work has rules. They didn't want to follow it. And instead, this is your issue, not theirs. If hiring managers are impressed by the content they find, like thought-provoking commentary or links to industry articles, they may be more apt to reach out to individuals for an interview. On the other hand, a lack of activity can actually be a turnoff. This is a balance point. You're either active and transparent, or where are you hiding? With the digital economy now driving much of the workforce, reinforcing your technical prowess with a strong digital presence can be helpful to job seekers. Your digital footprint is now a reality of life. If you want to do anything big in the world, you're going to have to understand how to craft your footprint and use it, says Harrington. He suggests individuals control the narrative through personal branding. Have a theme or a style woven through your social media and website. This will make it easier for headers to tell what content, for readers to tell what content is ver verifiably from you and what could have been put out by someone else about you. Leave a strong footprint. Now that you know what a digital footprint is, take the proper steps to cultivate it. The digital world isn't going anywhere anytime soon, so think of it as a lifelong development. Take advantages of the platform to present yourself in a good light and show off your best abilities. After all, you never know who will be looking in your newfound digital economy. Be sure to check out, and then they've got an info, infographic here, is your online branding helping or hurting you? And so th they'll give you more information here if, once again, I guess they've actually removed it. Um, so they, they don't have that available there. But that was um, really helpful. So I want to bring us into 1984. What was 1984? That was required reading for many of us. And at the point, we're told you're reading this because you want to be aware of what can happen in the future. But now that we know what we know, and we're now in 2020, way past 1984, do you think it was grooming us? more so than educating us? That's a moment to go, hmm. But let's look at this one for just a minute. So 1984. Uh, 1984, a novel often published as 1984, is a dystopian social science fiction novel by English novelist George Orwell. It was published on 8th of June, 1949, 
So in this point, 1984 was so far off, many people didn't believe it would happen. Even in the 70s, when um, it was called to my attention, 1984 seemed like a, a long ways to go. And um, Orwell, it was Orwell's ninth and final book completed in his lifetime. Thematically, 1984 centers on the consequences of total terrorism and, and massive surveillance. And, repre and repressive regimation of persons with behaviors within society. Doesn't that sound like today? We've been inching towards this. This is where we're at today. Orwell himself, a democratic socialist, modeled the authoritarian government in the novel after Stalinist Russia. Again, isn't that what we have today? More broadly, the novel examines the role of truth and facts within politics and the ways in which they are manipulated. The story takes place in an imagined future, the year 1984, when much of the world has fallen victim to perpetual war, omnipresent government surveillance, historical neg uh, negativism, and propaganda. Great Britain, known as Airstrip One, has become a province of the totalitarian superstate named Oceania that is ruled by the party who employed the thought police to part persecute individually, individuality, and independent thinking. Again, the CCP in China has brought that. They have mastered this. They have manipulated it. And this leading into this election where most of the channels we watch on YouTube have been purged throughout the year. The most recent major purge was less than a month ago on October 15th when the rest of those truth seekers and turning on the light were banished from the channel. And we've seen that even direct messages not publicly shown on Twitter are being blocked. And the president of the United States, who, by the way, even though the election happened a few days ago and they're still deciding the ballots under the, the clear guise of fraud, our president, who is elected for four years, not three years until the election starts, is, is being completely restricted on his own communication with the people via the Twitter platform. Tell him to go to another platform. Why, when Twitter, YouTube, Google, Facebook have become utilities, they are not just private companies that make their own rules. They weren't elected, and yet they are not only manipulating what we see, who we can connect with, and what, who can see us, they have moved way beyond that of a normal publisher. So let's continue here. Big Brother, the leader of the party, enjoys an intense cult of personality despite the fact that he may not even exist, right? The uh, protagonist, Winston Smith, is a diligent and skillful rank and file worker and party member who secretly hates the party and dreams of rebellion. He enters into a forbidden relationship with a colleague, Julia, and starts to remember what life was like before the party came to power. Now, for all of you, this is our warning. If you don't think what's going on isn't already in this scenario in the United States, wake up. Let's look at some of these. Minority Report. In 2002, the movie Minority Report was a long-planned collaboration between actor Tom Cruise and director Steven Spielberg. Based on Philip K. Dick's short story of the same name, the movie explores a future in which criminals are captured before they commit their crimes. Advertisements. Um, at verse, okay, the movie is filled with cool tech gadgets, driverless cars, holographic displays, personalized ads, jetpacks, and some really cool spider robots. Now, how cool were those spider robots? Remember the spider robot bots, um, they would roll them out onto the floor when they were seeking somebody, and the spider robots would go up to, to look at your eyes to identify uh, who the individual was. They had a camera on it and they had ears too because even when the bubble popped in the water, that sense of movement somehow was generated by the spider robot. They knew there was a sound or a movement in the room and returned back in order to identify if somebody was there. Now, how far in the future is this? Well, let's just look. This is a movie filled with tech gadgets, a driverless cars, 
already exist and, and are, are doing absolutely wonderful in the United States and in many other countries. They're called autonomous vehicles, which of course is my expertise. Holographic displays. We have holographic displays in many ways. And there was just a recent um, Kanye West notice to the public that he had given his, his wife, um, Kim Kardashian, a hologram of her, her father, who unfortunately had succumbed to cancer several decades ago. So he, he brought him back via a hologram. Uh, of course, our ads are so personalized that in the case of Intuit, I never even went down that path with that company and they scraped the data from somebody else and contacted me direct, even though I was inquiring for another individual. Jetpacks, there's been recently over the summer, there is an individual close to LAX who has been using a jetpack. They've been testing it down there. And now, of course, we have Raytheon and all the major uh, defense companies in that area. So they definitely have the, the technology, the funds, and the ability to do that. And then, of course, we have these sp spider robots, which we're going to discuss in a few clicks here. So let's look at Ring. Ring is a surveillance camera that you can buy, you can pay for, and you put right there on your front door. Now, what is important about this? This means that it is gathering information about when you come and leave through that front door, when your children come and leave through that door. Hackers can see that. The companies behind Ring can see it. Uh, you, all the data is collected. Well, they're also put strategically in front of the houses to monitor people that go by. Now you've probably seen as, as maybe you walk your dog or you walk around your neighbor, neighborhood that some of these ring don't just require you to walk up and push the bell, but it senses something walking by and a tone will play and you'll look to see where the tone is coming and it takes your picture because you've now looked. So they're actively grabbing images and tracking people's patterns. So let's click into this one right here. This is Ring and its doorbell cameras have partnered with over 400 police departments. That's correct. Police agencies actually handed out these units. So this is Eric Levinson, and this was back in August of 2019. This is um, CNN. So let's just um, look at just quickly on this. The video doorbell company Ring is working with more than 400 U.S. police departments to streamline their access to user videos. Yep, they can see direct. And if you um, agree to this, they don't even need a warrant. The company announced on Wednesday, Ring, which is owned by Amazon, says a partnership will allow police to post important safety information and view and comment on public posts to a Ring-operated portal. Police can submit requests for video recordings for certain locations to help with active investigations. Or not, just to spy on their girlfriend or boyfriend is gonna, is, has been happening as well. But concerned privacy advocates say the partnership threatened to create a 24-7 surveillance program. It is essentially a widespread CCTV network in which police and Amazon have access to cameras across the city on everybody's front door, says Matthew, a, pol a policy analyst for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit advocate for civil liberties in the digital world. As part of Ring's announcement, the company released an active law enforcement map that shows 405 police departments that use the Neighbors Portal, which is an extension of Ring's Neighbors for app for the police. Here you go. If you live in any of these cities uh, a year ago, well, thanks to your neighbors not being wise about what they're doing, they're collecting data about you as well. And these are all the precincts who bought into it. Come on, people, absolutely wake up. If you want surveillance on your home, that's fine. You can do a CCTV, as they mentioned here, and that just means it's, it's closed circuit. You would set up your own monitor in your home. You can buy, um, I, I have it wired because again, once anything is wireless, it can be grabbed more easily, but you can wire it directly into your CCTV. You can have a VCR attached to it as many of us have. At this point, it's actually digital. It can be wired right into a hard drive or computer and monitored safely in your home that you have control over. And, and in reality, it is actually cost less for you to set up your own CCTV network it, with a, a digital background and wired than it is to use any of these off the shelf 
uh, products because of the monthly fee that they end up charging um, to tie into their their system where they are grabbing your data for you. So again, wake up. How about this one, Amazon Alexa? Many of us fell for it. We bought the little round disc that is so cute and sits in the corner and you can ask it any questions you want. It can play music. It just really adds to the, the wonders of the family. Well, hello. Amazon ordered to give um, Alexa evidence in a double murder case. This isn't new. This was November of 2018. An Echo smart speaker, which features an artificial intelligent voice assistant Alexa, was seized from a home in Farmington where two women were stabbed to death. An Amazon um, Echo smart speaker could provide crucial evidence in the double murder case in the U.S. after a judge in New Hampshire ordered the tech giant to provide investigators with recordings from the device. The speaker, which features the artificial intelligent voice assistant Alexa, was seized from a home in Farmington where two women were killed in January 2017. Now I have a challenge with this system. Those little devices don't have backup on them. They're live, they're wired into the net. You don't seize the speaker. All the data is already backed up with Alexa, which is Amazon, and this is what the um, police go directly for. And in order for Amazon to, to continue to work with the intelligent agencies, they're not gonna stand up for your rights. They're gonna go ahead and continue to turn it over. This is the same as what the CCP is doing. Timothy Verrill, 36, is charged with killing Christine Sullivan and General uh, Jenna Peregrini by stabbing each woman multiple times. The judge, Stephen Horan, wrote in the court order that an echo device present in the home may have captured audio that would provide key evidence in the case. So you can read that, that more. There was another case as well where there was an Amazon Alexa in an individual's home. That individual left that home and went to another location in order to commit the murder. And they still wanted his Amazon Alexa device in his home, even though it was not at the location of the crime, because if there's any way that he thought about it or planned or searched via that device, they grabbed it. And in fact, it, it was allowed in the, the court case. So what else do we have here? Um, Amazon has this brilliant idea of, let me see, here we go. Amazon is coming out with a flying indoor security camera drone. Now, as we get through this, I wanna bring you right back here to the spider cameras of Minority Report, except you are paying for it in your own home. So this is uh, September 24th, 2020. The Verge, and this was covered, we, we covered this on this channel back in September, so I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but essentially this cute little thing that w might sit in your, in your office or in your home, it just kind of looks like one of those, I don't know, essential oil diffusers, except the top comes off, there's a camera, it's got eyes and ears, eyes meaning there's a camera to see and ears, it's a listening device. And they, of course, um, tell you that it's not going to be available yet, so they're building up anticipation, be ready in 2021. It's only going to cost about $250, so this price point is very low. And you can um, uh, tie it right into your internet, so it's very easy. You can use it as a, a voice assistant. And what it'll do is it will um, secure your home, so it'll fly around your home and make sure that at night while you and your loved ones are in bed sleeping, that if anybody breaks in or there's any noises, this thing will get up and go look at it. Very, very expensive and dangerous. So on the most comical, what happens when you get up in the, in the middle of the night and you go to use the bathroom? Well, you're recorded because it wants to know what you're doing. They also state that it can't be hacked. It's 100% safe. Well, we all know that not only is it being hacked because it's tied directly into the Amazon um, database that they've created for the back end, but it's um, if man created it, it can be hacked. So here's your warning, don't. This is the Amazon flying indoor security drone. And this is what we saw in um, leading up from Minority Report. So here we have another article that, that I pulled up. Home Wi-Fi used to count people in a home. So years ago, I was doing a, a, a international program 
and this happened happened to be some some individuals who worked for Microsoft at the executive offices and they happened to be based over in Russia and they were showing me that in my own home at any time they could tell me how many people were in my home and what our patterns were of when we were home and when we were not and and the way they did that is I had a Wi-Fi and so it was located in one part of the house and it would send signals throughout the house and it was strong enough to to measure movement so if there was a dog, it would pick up the dog. And if there was an adult, it would pick up the adult if there was a child. And it, based on that movement, they could identify patterns of when people were home and how many people were there. And this was many years ago. So imagine the technology today. So this one that I want to click on here, we only have a few more to go, but I really think this is uh, important to create the awareness. This is um, 17 technologies of people tracking. The search is behavioral analytics retail. This was published by Ronnie Max on March 21st, 2020. This was this year. And if we look at this really fast, they've got left, enter, engage, center, engage, flow. Uh, uh, highlighting and and when they're um, tracking this their key terms and entire departments and tech companies that are, are tracking monitor and going into live feed and tagging these and this says anonymous in-store customer tracking behavior and analytics and uh, academy people tracking technologies generate actionable insights to increase conversation rates and profits of physical locations regardless of how you track people the location location position and time-based data quantify the in-store customers journey in retail stores shopping malls airports stadiums and smart cities to put it simple by tracking people's behavior in your physical location you can build a data-driven decision process and get more conversions sales and profits from the assets you already have. In other words, you can more easily take the money out of somebody else's savings account and put in your bank account. If you think you need in-store customer tracking, you do. So again, who is this helping to support? Technologies deployed to track people to, um, behaviors include and there's a list here and I'm going to state them in just a minute, but I worked for a publicly traded company and what I did is I, I took off the shelf software, integrated it with existing hard, hardware and tracked patterns of, of our um, clients without giving away uh, the, the business that it was at. And we significantly increased the length of time people were there, the amount that they spended, uh, spent rather, um, their uh, return and the amount of people that they would return with just by tracking and feeding them data in a timely basis. For instance, as they were wrapping up the end of the workday, we knew their traffic pattern and we could ping them and say, oh, we're having a special tonight, bring two friends. There we go, we directed their behavior. This is um, huge and it's used more than you think. So at the end of the month, when you have more, more month at the end of your money, rather than more money at the end of your month, know that it's not planned. Everybody has a plan. And if you don't have a plan for yourself, they have a plan for you. So let's quickly look at this. AI deep learning vision, biometrics, facial record recognition, biometric facial demographics, biometrics, eye tracking, 3D spatial learning, augmented reality, 3D stereo video analytics, 2D monocular and fisheye video analytics, thermal imaging, time of flight, which is TOF, structured light 3D scanner, LIDAR 3D laser scanning, open source Raspberry Pi, Wi-Fi, wide area network location tracking. This is what I was mentioning in my own home. UWB, ultra wide band radar imaging. BLU, Bluetooth low energy beacons. Yes, do not walk around with your Bluetooth on, cut it off. GPS global positioning systems, personal trackers. And RFID, radio frequency identification tags and tracking, which are also in your credit cards. People tracking technologies. Quantify human behavior by location, time, and activity. The tracking solutions can be interactive or anonymous. It could track objects, devices, or things to capture the behaviors of a real person. The complexity of the tracking system depends on location positioning, recognition attributes, and precision parameters. 
So again, you can um, uh, read through here, but it's, these are whole industries and these industries has been around for more than two decades uh, at a high level of surveillance. It just, I'm just scanning through these so you can see a little bit while I'm talking here. But again, this is not to help you. This is not to make your shopping easier. This isn't anything that's going to make life better for you. You don't need to buy another shipload of, of containers from China. We need to learn how to live and grow and be part of society. And yet every time we turn around, we are being tracked. So we take this little piece of data that they gather in stores. We take the little piece of data of the ring device you put on your front door, tracking times coming and going. We track your Wi-Fi activity, your IP address, any little footprints that you leave in the internet. We'll take anything you post, any pictures that you or even your friends may post uh, about you. And all of this goes into, yes, your digital footprint. There, some people say there's not much I can do. This is the world we live in. In actuality, there is a lot we can do. There's a lot that we can do in order to protect ourselves and a lot that we can do in order to start protecting our loved ones. How about that two, three, four-year-old child that you have? Stand up for that child. Stop giving away their information. Having a 5% discount today is not worth a lifetime of digital footprint creation for your child. Does your child really need a Facebook account? How about the manipulation and emotional tugging of being on social media and needing to get that like or thumb up? I'm pausing here for just a minute. The European Union created GDPR. In China, the government actually supports the development of facial recognition technology. So these are opposing ends of the spectrum. GDPR truly protects to the best that we've seen right now, a, a digital identity of an individual. So for instance, if you buy an Audi in the United States, you're op, you automatically opt in. If you opt out, you don't buy the Audi. But if you buy an Audi in, in let's say Germany, you need to opt in for any of the surveillance. So as you know, any car after 2009 in the United States has technology embedded in it that tracks you. That's correct, your car newer than 2009 does. Even if it's not a smart car, it's under the hood. Now, as we get further and further along with the satellite radios inside and the smart electronics, there's more trackability and more data being collected. In Europe, it, let's go back to that car, where you're going, the, um, the cameras on the outside of the car, the cameras on the inside of the car, the listening devices that it has, every time you put in a location in your mapping system, anytime you're driving around, your speed limit, the amount of time you spend at different places, the routes you take, how many, uh, what the weight is of your car at different picture points of the day, all of this, you have to opt in. So for instance, if you want to allow a mobile, mobile eye, which is an Israeli surveillance company, that all, all autonomous vehicle and most electric cars in California I'm sorry, in the United States, have contracts with that give all your data. Yes, if you have a Tesla, your, all your information, the eyes and ears inside the car, outside the car, everything you do hear and say is transposed to an Israeli intelligence agency known as Mobileye. Now, in, in um, Europe, you have to opt in for whether or not they can know your specific information, whether they can get just generalized tracking, whether or not they can have cameras on or can you opt in for each, each one of the different variances and levels of your personal privacy. Here in the United States, once again, you opt in by the fact that you bought it or you're on the site, but you opt out by the fact that you're now kicked off the site or you don't get the item. This is really important. And of course, the other end of the spectrum is China where um, they are tracking everybody and everything and friends of friends. Biometrics, let's just keep scanning down this so you can see a little bit more and then you can um, either come back or pause on it. Uh, um, so this has been tested for years and years, uh, decades. Um, Japan was really one of the leaders in surveillance and um, application of such technologies. Um, here we go, just wanna. LIDAR is, of course, the core technology that is making autonomous vehicles. All autonomous vehicles that are considered viable have um, three, three eyes, 
uh, LIDAR, radar, and camera systems. And then EARS, they have listening devices both inside and outside the car. Um, open source Raspberry Pi is, um, is of course something you can just buy. I think the last time I saw them was over the shelf, 49 bucks. You can get yourself set up. GPS personal tracker, you wear this yourself and you're telling somebody everywhere you're at. Wi-Fi location tracking, everything is, is in here. Um, so anyways, I'd, I'd encourage you if you're interested in digging deeper to take a, a look at, at this site. And I will put the link down in the, the site below for this. I'm going to just finish up around the corner here. There's a, a couple more I want to click on before we move on. And again, this site is not to educate you. This site is to educate um, somebody who owns a retail shop or a, a company that wants to implement such strategies and track the people for the purposes of taking money out of your account and putting it in their account. So let's uh, look at social engineering. What is social engineering? Social engineering is the art of manipulating people so they give up confidential information. Now one of the, the most basic is, as a salesperson, you're taught to go make smokers calls. You think, well, who smokes anymore? Well, a lot of people do. So one of the, the easiest ways to get information is you used to be able to walk in the front door of a company, um, talk to if there's somebody in the lobby or not, and um, get, you know, get yourself directed in the right direction, ask a few questions. They'll tell you who the right person to talk to. They'll come out or you can go right to their desk. Well, that, those days are long gone. All the individuals who greet you in tech companies are actually security. And most of the security doesn't even work for the company. They're through a third party agency. They're not there for customer service. They're not there for you. They're stealing your data and they don't wanna to talk to you. So, so one thing that you can always do when you wanna find out more information about a company is, is go to the smokers corner. Uh, because of, especially in California, most smokers have to be outside of the building, not even in a, common outdoor area within the structure. They have to go outside somewhere on a periphery and so many feet away from a doorway. And they're going to be standing there for how many minutes in order to smoke that cigarette. So if you go up and, and you start chatting with them, smokers usually started smoking because they want to be accepted. They want to be a part of the group. They're usually socially outgoing individuals. So they're going to be happy to have somebody to talk to, and they'll answer any of your questions for you. It's one of the easiest way to implement social engineering. So let's continue this. The types of information these criminals are seeking can vary, but when individuals are targeted, the criminals are usually trying to trick you into giving them your passwords or bank information, or access your computer to secretly install malicious software that will give, you the, give them access to your passwords and blank information, as well as giving them control over your computer. Now, social engineering isn't really used as much to gain access to a computer anymore. What they'll often do um, and, and it, hap it works almost every time, is they might put a USB down like it fell out of a pocket or something in a parking lot or over by that smoker's corner I just mentioned. They, somebody might drop a USB and somebody will pick it up. And rather than being smart enough to give it to security for them to scan for viruses or worms, they'll take it back to their computer, see what's on it, see if they can identify who it belongs to and see if they can help track it down. But that's not what that USB does. As soon as it's tagged into a mainframe computer or computer that's set up into the into the, the system, then all of a sudden information is transferred and downloaded. And that term scraping that I mentioned has already occurred before you know it. And because it's come in through a, a regular portal, uh, many smaller companies don't even recognize that there's been a breach. So let's click on what is social engineering examples and prevention tips. And I think this is how we're rounding it out today. This is webroot.com, cybersecurity resources. Social engineering is the art of manipulating people so they give up confidential information. The types of information these criminals are seeking can vary, but when individuals are targeted, the criminals are usually trying to trick you into giving them your passwords or bank information or access your computer to secretly install malicious software that you will give them access to your passwords and bank information as long as giving them control over your computer. Now, I mentioned earlier I was dealing with an identity theft case. This was an, an elderly woman. And she had gotten a series of phone calls from Apple Care. Well, Apple doesn't call you. 
uh, but uh, she didn't even have an Apple computer. So, uh, but she's polite and she's from the, the, the days where if somebody calls, it's your responsibility to polite and talk to them and be friendly. And she would say, I don't have, but they would get more and more persistent. Yes, but at some point there must have been one there and they're showing a breach and we just need to go in and fix it and we'll be in and out. Well, eventually they talked her into accessing her computer and then that was all they did. And then they call back another time and says, you know, we helped you the other day, but it looks like the breach is more severe. We need to do another step. So they gained her favor. And then what they did is they gained access to all of her bank accounts and transferred the money into those Disney cards that I mentioned that were digital cards. They weren't mailed to anybody and untrackable. So that was all a social engineering technique that was used. Criminals use social engineering tactics because it is usually easier to exploit your natural inclination to trust than it is to discover ways to hack your software. For example, it's much easier to fool someone into giving you your password than it is for you to try hacking their password unless the password is really weak. So this article goes on into phishing and what does a social engineering attack look like? Email from a friend, email from another trusted source. So we're going to branch more into this in, a, in an upcoming episode, but I just wanted to touch on the spectrum here to let you know that it is really your responsibility to step up and start defending your digital footprint because no matter what you do, it is breached. And this is the home security version of what products are you bringing into your home? What products are you agreeing to allow FBI and police to surveil your home and your neighbors? What kind of devices are you using and what alternatives are available to you at actually much less cost? We need to wake up. We need to defend our own digital privacy and that of our children. It is our responsibility to protect. Yes, at some point, we fall victims to different strategies. There's only so much we can do. But as long as you have the foundations in place, they'll hit the firewall too and won't be able to dig out everything on you. So this is Pink Blue, episode 160. This was 11.6, Defending Your Digital Footprint, Home Security Version.